When I go to annual conference, there, a friend of mine is the manager of the bookstore that gets put up every year. The annual conference, the yearly gathering of all the Methodist pastors and a representative from every church. And, and so the Methodist bookstore, Cokesbury, shows up. And, and knowing the manager, I, I show up uh, and help her unload and set it all up. And I do that uh, just to be able to hang out with her, but also because there's a, it's always interesting to hear the news. Every industry has its news, what's going on, and the book publishing industry is like any other. And one of the times I was uh, moving books, just lifting books, I heard, overheard a conversation about uh, book titles. Because if you think about it, a book title is important. If you have a good book but a bad title, it's doomed, right? So getting the title right matters. And it turns out that they have figured out what there is one word in Christian book publishing that if you put this word in your title, it will destroy the sales. It will just decimate it. If you put this one word in the title, it will not sell very well at all. And you want to guess what that word is? It starts with an E, right? Evangelism. You put the word evangelism in your book title and you might as well just kiss, kiss that sucker goodbye, right? It, it's the, the topic no one wants to talk about. It, it's up there. There's, if there's like the top three of topics that no one wants to talk about, the sermons you never want to hear, I think it'd be foot washing. <laughs> Am I going to have to take my shoes off? Uh, stewardship, Pledge Sunday, seriously. But then uh, I think top of the list would be evangelism. It's, it's the one thing no one ever wants to talk about. Now, evangelism, as you may have heard before, is a good word. The word evangel means good news. It's a good word with a very bad reputation. Uh, I think in part because of the way it is caricatured and abused. Um, it, it seems to evoke talking about evangelism and people start thinking about being asked, do you know where you'll go if you'll die tonight? Right? That sort of heavy-handed, sort of leaning in and, and asking. And some of you, can, I can see who that connects with, right? I, I wasn't as familiar with this growing up in the suburbs. I went to uh, the South for seminary. I went to Duke. And I was introduced to uh, this heavy-handed evangelism. And it goes by, uh, it is sometimes called Bible thumping. Anyone here heard of Bible thumping? I, I really contemplated sending out an email asking everyone to bring your biggest and floppiest Bible to see who had the best weapon, right? It can't be uh, a hardcover. It's got to be it's got to be the leather, so it has some good floppage to it, right? Who, who, who can really... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, Bible thumping. Anyone here been Bible thumped before? Anyone ever been on the receiving end of a heavy-handed lean? That sort of, do you know? Is he lo your Lord? And say <laughs> I've been on the receiving end of it. And uh, when it happened, I was confused. Like, first it was like... Seriously? I was, I was in an urban ministry wearing my name tag that said chaplain, and someone was leaning on me. Do you know Jesus as your Lord? Is Serious? And then I got angry, because I mean, I got angry. This is not how to do this. This is bad, right? So when we start talking about evangelism, we're talking about being good news, and if we have this, uh, this caricature warped understanding of it, that it's this heavy-handed leaning into people and sort of trying to get them to make a decision right now for Jesus, and, and the response in an unjustifiable, justifiable and understandable response is, but preacher... These are the people I'm going to see at the gas station. And if I'm a jerk to them, and I, and I have their kids or my, or my grandkids are in the same class as them, or I'm going to see them in the grocery store, I'm not going to do that. Like, I'm not going to be that rude to people. I'm not going to lean on people like that. And so what ha has happened over the last generations or so is that if the, with, uh, for the most part, people in the pew say, you know what, I'm not going to be like that. Well, who is going to do the evangelizing? Right? Who's going to do this awkward thing that we don't want to do? Well, let's see. Who here in the room is paid to be here? Anyone? Anyone paid? Do we pay anyone here? Oh, yeah, you, pastor. Why don't you go do that for us? Right? And that's what happens. How many times have you heard the phrase, if only we could get a pastor who brings people into the church? 
I, I'm not going to tell you how many times I've heard the phrase. Because <laughs> that's what happens. The pastor is sort of the professional Christian, and we don't want to do it because we're not going to be rude to these people that we're going to live with long after you're gone, preacher. So why don't you go be our evangelist for the church? And uh, to ask the question that Dr. Phil asks, how's that working for you? Right? How's that working? I don't think it is. Right? I think the church has lost its way with regards to evangelism. And I think it is due in part to a loss of a focus on eschatology, what we've been talking about these last Sundays, these ideas around the, the kingdom of God, right? That we are going somewhere good, that we have a plan. We, we know that we are heading towards the kingdom of God, that the forgiveness that Jesus offers on the cross is the forgiveness that breaks us from the sin of the past, but it's the promise of resurrection that we're heading towards the promised land, the, the good news of the kingdom. That is where we're headed. That's what drives our evangelism, that we know where we're going and we want to invite you along with us. That, that's what drives us to be able to be good news. And, and we, I want to talk about that, this today. How do we be good news? How do we be evangelistic without being jerks? Mm -hmm. Like, if, if at any point we are, uh, if, you, if at any point you, the thought is, I'm being a jerk, but I'm being a jerk for Jesus, then you're not really being it for Jesus. Like, you can't get to Christ-like ends by non-Christ-like means. It, it, it doesn't work. If you look at Scripture, Jesus is not a jerk, right? We have to be graceful and Christ-like in how we are evangelistic, or else we're really not being good news. And so what does Jesus do? If you look at what Jesus does, he spends his time teaching and healing people, proclaiming the kingdom of God has come near. And then he takes these disciples in Luke 9, so they've been at it for a while, and he says to the twelve, Go out and proclaim the kingdom of God and heal. Go out and be good news to people. Go out and help people and tell them why you're doing it and then come back. And that's what they do. And then in Luke 10, a little bit further down the road, he sends out a larger group. He takes 70 people, or 72. From, we can't actually figure out whether it's 70 or 72. He takes a bunch of people, and he says to them, go out two by two, right? Do not do this alone. Do this together. Does anyone want to go do the work of the church alone? Nope, right? Go do this together. Go out and proclaim the kingdom of God. Reach the people that need to be reached. Help the people that need to be helped. He does this on a regular basis, sending out people two by two together. And just in case anyone misses it, his last words, it's in Matthew 28, some of the last things he says to the disciples, go and make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them all that I have taught you. And so it becomes clear as we read about following Jesus that we who call him Lord, part of his lordship is, is that he directs us to go be good news to people, be evangelistic. And so how do we do this? Right? How do we do this? How do we do this in a way that do doesn't have us feeling like we're being jerks, worried about whether we see someone in the grocery store? How do we practice evangelism in a way that is truly graceful and Christ-like? I have an observation and then two suggestions, and uh, none of this should be a surprise since we've experienced all of it, but, but here we go. The observation. When you walk into a room, an organization, for the first time, it's the first time you're bringing your kid to Cub Scouts, the first time you go to a, if you're invited to be part of Masons, the first time you go to a school board meeting, first time you go to a church, whatever gathering of people it is, if you walk in and they don't have a chair open for you and everyone looks at you and no one helps you or hands you the paperwork, are you going to come back? No, right? The first part of, beco of becoming part of a community is having a sense of belonging. You walk in and you sit down and you have a sense, I belong here. I am welcome here. They're taking the time to make sure I, I know that I am welcome here. Right? So if we're going to become, belonging comes first. And then once you're in the room, 
you start doing what they do. Right? If I, I showed up to Cub Scouts for the first time, short Andy, far shorter Andy, and I belonged. Ah, I want to go back, Mom and Dad. So they took me back. And you know what they did? They said, hey, why don't you come camping with us? So now I start behaving. If once you belong, then you start behaving like people in that group. So what do you do? You go camping. Because that's what you do if you're in Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts. So you should start going camping with them over time. And once you belong, and once you start to behave like that group, the last step is you start to believe like that group. And so if you walk out to that green box out there, you know what you're going to find in the back of it? Right? Enough outdoors gear that if, a, if five feet of snow and seven, 70 inches of rain happened this afternoon, you know who'd be dry and warm? Right? Be prepared. Right? I belonged, and I started to behave like them, and it rubbed off, and now I am a Boy Scout. Right? That, that's what I am. That's how I believe. That's how it, you think about how evangelism usually is conceived of. Where, do we, where is it conceived of starting? You start taking your Bible and asking people, do you believe in Jesus? Is that the right place to start? No. Right? How did I? Th thank you. I like the feedback. Well, how did Andy become a Christian? I went to the Wesley House at Truman, and they, they had free meals every Sunday and college students free food. I am there. It's still true, actually. But I, I went because they had free food and they had a spot for me, and I was comfortable there. And a friend brought me, and I belonged there. And so when I belong there, what happens next? I'm there when they invite me to do what they. So I start behaving like them. I went on the float trip. I, we're doing this book study. It's by C.S. Lewis. I read it. Did I agree with everything? Nope. But they're doing it, so I will do it too. And, and then over time, the, the, the belief sort of comes down the road. And so if we're going to talk about evangelism, it is tomfoolery to start by asking, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? That's way down the road. Where do you start? You start by being great hosts, right? By setting a table where all people are welcome, and you take that table to them. That's where we start. And then we invite them over time to do what we do. Because that was such a good time, why don't you come along and have a good time with us again? And then we trust that as they hear the gospel proclaimed, Maybe they come to Easter, maybe they come to Christmas, down the road, that they will then be able to make that decision down the road. But this is where we start. Right? So how do we start here? This is where I can give you your two practical suggestions. Two practical suggestions. Here is what we can do. There are probably other ways of doing this, but how, how do we start with, with, with this? How do we start with... One last detail about this. The difference between being friendly and making friends. You all know the difference there? Being friendly is, hey, how you're doing? Glad you're here. Making friends is then, then following up, sitting next to them and asking and like talking. Right? How, do we be, how do we become friends with people? Two ideas. First, we go outside and we create an event that is pure chewing satisfaction. We go out there and we create an event so that people can come together and have a good time. We do this because we believe that we are headed towards the kingdom of God in which all people will be reconciled, when the family will be brought together, when we will all understand and see and experience each other as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And so when we get together and invite the entire community, we are creating family reunions for the family who don't realize their family yet. Right? That's what we're doing. And so we create these events. Is it one big one a year? Huge carnival out there? Maybe. Is it a barbecue competition all summer long? And one, one month we do pork, one month we do beef, and I mean, we could do chicken, I guess, but we could go back to pork. I don't know. Create a series of events outside of the church. Because if we invite them into the church, are they going to show up? No. Well, thank you. Good job. Uh, <laughs> We gotta get out there and go to them. Create an event that we can invite our neighbors to so that we can offer good news. And here's what good news sounds like. Hey, 
We're having a good time next Saturday at the, outside the church in our parking lot. We're going to do A, B, and C. It's going to be tasty and free. Can you join us? Can you say that? Right? Is that possible? Is this, this, it's not a hard lift, right? I'm going to have a good time. Can you please come share it with me? That's good news. That is being good news to people. That is sharing something exciting. And you say it to everyone. Are they part of another church? Great, invite them. Are they part of no church? Great, invite them. Do you know anything about them other than you just, just met them at the gas station and you want to talk to them again? Great, invite them. Right? The point is to create these family reunion type moments to bring people together so that we can create the sense of belonging. We can be hosts to them. We can go out there and not mingle amongst ourselves, but mingle with them and start making friends. And once we have done that, that is when, what happens after that? Like, what, what happens? People have come to events outside the church wall for this year, next year, years to come, and, and this becomes the church where if you want to go have a good time, you go to that parking lot and you just wait to see what happens, right? Because we're going to have a good time there, or wherever we go and do this. Then, when a family hits a hard time, what's the church they're going to turn to? Then, when they need to raise their children, their children need, they need help raising their children, what community are they going to turn to? Then, when they need to figure out where they're going to go for Easter or Christmas, where are they going to turn to? They, they start to behave like, like us. As, they become, as they're comfortable belonging, then they start to behave like, like us as well. So, that's the community event approach. Have a good time, invite everyone you know, and everyone you want to know. The other approach is to go out and to serve. To serve because we know where we're headed. We're headed towards the time, uh, the kingdom of God, when everything will be made right and true and reconciled. And if we're heading that way, let's dig into it now and do the kingdom work now. Let, let's do something about our sense of commitment to God's will being done on earth as it is to heaven. And as we know that this is a monumental task, so we bite off more than we can chew, intentionally. Why? Because if you're running towards a problem that's worth solving, and you start asking for help, you know what's going to happen. People are going to help. Right? Some people run towards problems. And you, we need to find the people who run towards problems in our community. We run towards the biggest problem and we say we need help and people show up and, and, and help. And in that moment, we are being good news to two groups. The first group is the group you expect me to say. The group who is being helped. Now the thing about helping someone who is drowning is that if you're helping someone who is drowning, what's first on their mind? getting out of the water, right? They're not going to be thinking about their eternal salvation at that point. They're just thinking about getting out of the water. There's the other group we're helping, though. Who are the other lifesavers? Right? For us to jump in the water and go do life-saving, this is good news to the other lifesavers, because now what do they know? They have help. Right? They have someone to jump in the water with them. They have a partner who is going to jump in. There's that uh, phrase uh, from uh, Man of La Mancha, the impossible dream, to march into hell for a heavenly cause. Right? If you're going to march into hell, you sure do want to have someone to march in there with you. And there are people in our community who will march into hell for a heavenly cause, and they need reinforcements. They need to know there are people, and, and think about again, belong, right? We, we, if we are doing, if we're marching into hell for a heavenly cause, we are going to help people come hell or high water. We belong, we, we are comfortable doing this together, and we're already behaving together, us and the lifesavers. Well, that just leaves the next step, right? You're doing this with us. We're doing it because we love Jesus Christ. You tell us why you're doing it, let's talk. Right? That... In general, those are my two understandings of evangelism. It doesn't involve having the biggest and floppiest Bible. Though I still want to know who has, if anyone has a bigger or floppier Bible, I'd love to see it. <laughs> evangelism is about creating places to belong and then and being able to invite them to behave like we do and believe and to trust that as people behave like we do and behave like we do, meaning following Jesus, that belief will come 
right? That in worship, as we stand up and we confess the, the Apostles' Creed, as we stand up and we confess our sins, as we stand up and, and we are able to come forward to communion, that, that will shape how we believe and will shape anyone so that they might believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We do this through creating experiences of good news and joy to the, to the community. We do this through going out to serve together. We do both of these things because of our commitment to the kingdom of God that is to come. It will take effort in planning. It takes work on the back end for the church to do the organizing so that you can go out and do it together. But you can do this. Does anyone feel overwhelmed by what we've talked about today? Right? Please go have a good time and invite some friends. Please go help people who need it. This is not rocket science. We just got to go do it. And do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As sometimes happens when I end a sermon, about five minutes later, I think, oh shoot, I forgot. I didn't, I, here's your PS. When we're helping people, they're drowning, that doesn't mean we never invite them to church. It means we make sure they're not drowning and we can talk to them about it later. So that doesn't mean if you're drowning, that's it, we wash our hands of you. And, but just, just to be clear how that works. Um, what are the joys?